Hello, my name is Grandin Gill, and I am a professor at the Muma College of Business of the University of South Florida, and I'm also an editor of the Muma Case Review. And what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation is what you should be thinking about writing the first page of a discussion case. Now, what is contained in this presentation is specifically applicable to the Muma Case Review and also the Journal of IT Education discussion cases. However, I would say it generally applies to discussion cases published anywhere, whether it be Harvard, NACRA, uh, the Case Center of Europe, and so forth. So we will now get started. The focus of this presentation is on discussion cases. And what discussion cases do is they present a decision that needs to be made along with all the context you need to come up with sensible choices and evaluation of choices. Within the discussion case, the first page plays a very significant role. In fact, there are three objectives you want to accomplish on the first page. The first objective is to summarize the case. Uh, this is important because in most cases we don't have an abstract for our cases and instead use the content of page one uh, to give potential adopters of the case a clear idea of what the case is about. Because if you're a faculty member trying to decide whether or not to adopt a particular case for your class, you typically will not want to read the whole 15 or 20 page cases only to discover that the decision really doesn't fit your curriculum needs. The first page should make it very, very clear to the potential adopter uh, that the case is or is not within the domain of po uh, possibility for a class. After that, of course, they can read on. Now, a second objective is to engage the reader. Uh, one of the most important things about discussion cases is they should make the reader and the future participant in a discussion really interested in the decision that needs to be made. Because if you're not interested in the decision that needs to be made, it's going to be really hard to keep you uh, focused throughout the process of analyzing all the options. So this is uh, an important element of the case. And what you're really trying to do is build suspense, make the potential reader or the potential adopter get excited about uh, the decision that needs to be made and make them want to read on. Uh, the third objective of the uh, page one is to focus the reader's attention. One of the things about case studies is they tend to be quite long and often have a certain amount of information in them that won't necessarily be relevant to a particular decision. Uh, this is by design for the most part because in the real world it's very unusual to have clear markers regarding what is and is not relevant information for a decision. And knowing what the decision about and knowing the context of the decision can be extremely helpful in figuring out what is going to be important to focus on as you read the case and what can be skimmed. When a page one is constructed for the MUMA case review or the Journal of IT Education discussion cases, there are only three absolute requirements for that particular page one. The first is that it only be one page. As we have indicated, it's going to serve as a potential abstract and a potential way of deciding whether or not to adopt the case. If it goes past one page, uh, it becomes too long. The second requirement is it must identify the decision maker, otherwise known as the protagonist of the case. It is very rare that a case study uh, used for discussion will revolve around a decision that is not being made by an individual, but is instead being made by an organization. Because, for the most part, decisions are individual activities, uh, although of course you may need to achieve consensus uh, through a committee, and your decision may or may be what to recommend. But we need to know 
who is making that decision because the decision maker is going to be an important element of the case. Finally, of course, we also need to know what the decision is that the case is going to be built around. Now, it may be a single decision or it may be a multi-part decision, but we need to know what the decision uh, that is going to be made as a result of the discussion uh, should be. And throughout that case, uh, the decision is going to be the focus on the reader's mind. And of course, since it's a discussion case, we will not know what the actual decision was uh, when the uh, decision maker portrayed in the case actually got around to making the decision. That is always left open. Indeed, that is going to be the focus of the discussion. So, just to review, uh, whenever you create page one, you have to keep it at one page. You have to identify who the decision maker is. This should be an individual. And you must identify the decision that needs to be made. When you develop a case for the MUMA case review, it's nearly always going to have the same basic structure. And there are five elements to this structure two of which are optional but encouraged. So, very often, right under the title of the case, you are going to have some sort of quote, usually a quote from the decision maker, but it could be a quote from anywhere. And uh, this is optional. Uh, it expresses thoughts relating to the decision, and uh, it can make it seem more personal and engaging. So we encourage the quotes, but we don't necessarily require them. The next thing that you will almost always see in the page one is the protagonist. In particular, we want to introduce the protagonist. Uh, we want to give the protagonist name, which can be disguised, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's the real name, but we want to make it a person that we refer to throughout the case. Uh, we want to identify what organization uh, or group the uh, protagonist is affiliated with, and often we'll have a sentence or two that frames the decision without going into any details, just gives us a sense of where that decision is going. And this can often be done in a single small paragraph. The next thing we want to do is identify elements of context. And there is at least one element of context that we're almost nearly always going to have to cover, and then sometimes there's a second level. Specifically, uh, we will normally need to say a few words about the industry or organization uh, involved in the case. And again, this may be disguised uh, for reasons of uh, privacy or proprietary information. If you are doing a technology cases, and a lot of our case studies actually involve uh, new technologies, then you may also want to say something about the technology uh, that is going to be uh, the focus of the context for the decision. Uh, again, uh, you're going to be describing all of these things in much, much more detail in the body of the case, but on the first page we just want to give people a clear sense of uh, what the context is. And this is going to be important, for example, for a faculty member considering adopting a case, uh, because if a faculty member wants a, a case, for example, on identity theft, uh, he or she should be able to tell by reading the first page whether or not uh, this case is going to delve into the issues associated with identity theft. Now the fourth uh, thing that you will always have in a case on page one is a framing of the decision that needs to be made. And uh, that decision is going to be the focus of the case. Uh, hopefully on the first page you will convey that decision in a way that makes it seem like the decision matters because nobody wants to study a case where the decision does not matter. And uh, you should identify what the protagonist's role in making this decision is going to be. We've encountered a number of cases where the protagonist is not actually the decision maker, but is instead making a recommendation to the decision maker. That's fine. What decision to recommend is also a decision, but we want to understand um, the protagonist's 
role with respect to the decision, whether he or she is going to implement the decision or recommend the decision or is just thinking about the decision. Finally, we have one more sort of optional section, and this is where we look at alternatives being considered, especially when you're dealing with inexperienced participants in a case discussion. It's really useful to have some alternatives uh, so that they can use those as a starting point. You almost never want to say these four alternatives are the only things that we can consider, though in some cases that may be an accurate reflection of the case itself. Instead, you may want to leave it open that other alternatives can be proposed. But if you frame a case without any alternatives, just presenting a decision, uh, it's going to be very, very hard for inexperienced participants to discuss it. Now, if you're dealing with very experienced participants like executives or, say, people in their second year of the MBA program at Harvard, under those circumstances, they will probably be able to create reasonable alternatives just based upon their experience. But uh, when we use cases with undergraduates, we find it's really useful to have alternatives. And the alternatives can be framed in a number of different ways. Uh, they may be a specific set of choices, for example, different software products or uh, different companies to consider acquiring, or it may consist of a range of choices where at one extreme you may have do nothing and at some other extreme you may have a very, very specific set of activities. Uh, for example, if you were trying to figure out how much uh, to budget to an advertising uh, campaign uh, as part of your decision, uh, the alternatives might be zero to ten million dollars. And obviously you don't want to specify every single dollar possibility in that range. To make this all a little bit more concrete, what I have done is I have taken the front page of the first article published by the MUMA Case Review, and I'm going to use that to illustrate the five elements of uh, the typical page one of a case. So the first element is the quote. And if you take a look at the quote, the uh, title, Securing the Muma Journals, is followed by this quote. Now this particular case is sometimes known as a selfie case, which means that it is written about a decision being made by the case writer. And uh, that's fine as long as the case writer is willing to uh, look at all the elements associated with the decision that he or she made and try to do it as an objective way as possible. The only disadvantage of a selfie case is you have to keep referring to yourself in the third person. But nevertheless, I created this quote, uh, ending it with, but what level of risk am I willing to take when my school's name is on the line to illustrate that the decision is actually important to me and important to the school. And uh, as we'll find out shortly, the decision involves uh, trying to secure our open access online porter, uh, portal against hackers, making it a kind of cybersecurity case. Having presented this optional quote, what we then do is go on to introduce the protagonist. In this case, I'm introducing myself. So I identify the name, I identify the institutional affiliation. I provide just a sentence indicating the context of the case. And then uh, I am ready to move on to more detail. And you'll notice that the introduction of the protagonist and the introduction of the context kind of flow together. When you are creating page one, uh, even though we listed five elements, uh, you can transition between them smoothly. The key thing is by the end of page one to have covered all three of the required elements and possibly include the two optional elements. Having introduced the protagonist, the next thing we can do is introduce the context. And in this particular case, we've chosen to blend the context and the decision together because it just seemed to be more natural that way. So we're actually getting two components together. And uh, we talk about the formation of this open access journal here. And uh, we indicate uh, that uh, we were initially considering the technology WordPress. 
Now, since many readers might not be familiar with WordPress, uh, I provide a little bit of an introduction to the technology here as well. It's important on the first page just to give enough so that the reader has a general idea about what is going to be covered in the case because all of this material, the content on the technology, uh, the content on open access journals, all of these things is going to be covered in much more detail in the body of the case. But by signaling to the reader what the case is going to be about, the reader has a little bit uh, more of a heads up on what to focus on when he or she reads the case. We end the first page with the fifth and final element uh, of the uh, page one outline that we gave, which is a listing of alternatives. Now, as I mentioned, there are a lot of different ways to do this. And uh, if you look within the case itself, uh, the main thrust is trying to determine whether or not WordPress uh, is going to be secure enough so that we don't have to worry about it. And if it's not, what other alternatives we might look at. But since there are a lot of alternatives for running a journal editorial system that are out there, uh, it didn't make sense to try to cover all of these uh, on page one. So what we did here is we identified the fact that WordPress does potentially have some vulnerabilities. In the case, we discover that the vulnerabilities aren't necessarily with, within WordPress itself, but it may be within the add-ons you add to it. Uh, and uh, we consider the possibility, we'll look at alternative solutions, and uh, then uh, we talk about the question of if we were going to use WordPress, how would we deploy it? So all of these very technical decisions are going to be involved in the case. And uh, naturally, uh, we haven't really given a whole list of alternatives here, but we've given one clear alternative, WordPress. We realize there's going to be a lot of uh, tuning that may be needed if we choose that alternative. Another thing we can do is look for alternatives. And as we'll discover, those are looked at in the body of the case. And that should give the reader enough idea about what's going to go on in the case so they can decide if uh, it's a suitable case from the instructor's point of view or what to focus on uh, as they read the rest of the case from the uh, student participant's point of view. And with that, we pretty much have covered uh, the key elements of page one. What I will tell you about page one is that if you get page one right, uh, what will happen is that you will uh, find it much, much easier to write the case. And so what we suggest doing when you're writing a case is to begin by writing page one, then start writing the body of the case, and then what you'll do is you'll find yourself revising page one. And so as the case progresses, you may find your page one diverges considerably from your original page one. But writing it as a start really helps you as you write the case. Also, uh, if there is uh, an editor involved, if you're trying to publish it, uh, reading the page one should immediately tell the editor whether or not the case is going to have a structure which is appropriate for the journal because a lot of times when we get submissions of cases they're not discussion cases and they don't revolve around a decision and you should be able to tell that immediately from page one. So I thank you for your time and I hope this presentation has been useful and I hope that you will all write cases and uh, take these words to heart. Thank you very much.